Hello everyone, and welcome to my legendary starting guide for the Lizardmen, specifically the Last Defenders. The Last Defenders, if you are looking to get a legendary victory for the Lizardmen, I would strongly suggest the Last Defenders over the Hex. The unfortunate thing when it comes to dealing with the, the Hex here is the fact that you're surrounded by two very powerful enemies. You're going to have the Dark Elves attack you from the north, and the Skaven attacking you from the south. To get as far away from them as possible, the best choice is to use the Last Defenders. Not to mention, you start with very powerful units, and the overall faction effects and lord effects are just to your advantage completely. Which makes them a pretty, e pretty easy faction to beat as. But uh, overall, how would, I, how would I define this faction? versus the, all the other legendary factions, it will definitely be hard. You're going to be forced to like secure the coastline to win, but we'll get into that here in a second, and I'll show you how to make this campaign much easier, and so you can beat it. Okay, at the start of the campaign, we'll be discussing details, strategies, and how to further progress your campaign. Now, in general, the Lizardmen are... They have a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to the majority of battles, especially when you're going to be fighting the Skaven. To beat this legendary campaign, you'll be fighting against three Skaven clans. One located here, one located down here, and then you got the uh, the primary cl uh, Skaven clan, Clan Wars, located in the area over here. Secure To beat this campaign, the goal is to secure this entire coastline here. And if you want to, you can also secure these uh, islands to acquire additional income for you to support two very well-equipped armies. Two or three, it really depends. It is difficult to maintain a good amount of income for just securing the coast. The reasoning that I'm not pushing into this big open land over here is because there's just way too many angles to cover for, with a such a small force. Once you're going up against all these different factions, the vampires, the, the, the undead, you have dwarves, orcs, dark elves, the tomb kings. This area is uh, a battleground that quite honestly never ends. And fighting vortex armies at the same time, it's going to be very difficult to maintain this territory. So the best strategy you have is to secure this coastline and secure two choke points. A choke point located here in the south of jungles and the golden tower. Now do keep in mind all the enemies are going to go straight for this golden tower site right here. It's gonna it's like it's gonna funnel them in and this is and if you stack two of your bet like powerful armies two or three armies plus the garrison that's about four stacks worth of units you can beat back any Vortex army. Just having the right, the proper units, using utilizing Lightning Strike, utilizing Ambushes, and you could definitely win this campaign hands down. Not to mention, versus all the other legendary campaigns that I've done in this game, with the Last Defenders, you'll be having the opportunity to secure a number of treasures on this coastline to give yourself a bit uh, an additional income to keep your empire growing. But... That all being said, let's get down to the initial turns, and I'll show you guys what to do for each turn. Now, right at the start, I'll take your army and bring it back to the capital. Trying to engage this army right off the bat isn't really worth doing. This priest will be useful for your army later on in the game, once he gets a couple levels. You'll be going down his skills, take, you'll need a harmonic convergence, and then immediately go for Wind Blast. This skill is especially effective against the Lizardmen. Very powerful. It gets, well, yeah, it's strong against Lizardmen and the Skaven. Keep leveling it and you could destroy a horde of Skaven that are against your lines. For the jungle, the cursed jungle to the top right here, do not bother going for that until later on. The goal right now is to build up our forces and to engage the Skaven as soon as possible. If you don't attack this Skaven stack right here, 
it will continue to grow and there's another stack located in the area up here. If you just continue like turtling up in this area, eventually these two stacks will combine and they're going to be extremely difficult to fight. Not to mention, you do not want to play the battles against the Skaven. Maybe on lower difficulties you can get away with it, but on Legendary, the Skaven will have a more a leadership bonus, and unfortunately your primary unit, the Saurus Warriors, have this debuff, which is gonna... which is called Primal Instincts. That debuff is gonna cause some serious problems. Essentially, if the unit suffers enough damage, you will lose control of it and they will go berserk. These Skaven have a lot of slingers, so they can just outrun you and just pepper you to death. It's death by a thousand cuts, so... Not worth going. Not worth really playing. Most of the time you'll be autoing in the early game for the last defenders. As for your buildings, I would go for a public order bonus right off the start, because with the... With the legendary difficulty, I mean, you got that massive minus and it delays the rebellion a little bit longer. You could on the first turn also make a non-aggression pact with the High Elves, the Tor, Tor Elasaur Islands. But uh, in my playthrough, in all I'll say, they don't bother you at all. They're going to be busy with the Skaven. And eventually, if they start landing their forces, their primary armies, on this coastline, their, their ports are going to be left undefended. Will be ripe for the picking for a raid for a good raid. You could easily get like maybe like thirty thousand, forty thousand gold if you commit to a raid like that. With your primary army built in the Temple of Skulls, book close to the border, and build another couple of Saurus Warriors as much as you can build. Unfortunately, you you can't really have that big of an income with this faction. Since you're just securing this coastline, it's going to be very difficult since you're building the Saurus Warriors, but a good way to describe this campaign is that there will be a lot of sacrifices to obtain victory. In this next battle, there will be a stack located in the Serpent Coast, and then we're going to attack it, and an auto it. And we will suffer three casualties, but we will have victory. You'll be in, you'll be like tempted to play the battle, but in all honesty, you will suffer more losses than you need to because of all of these Skaven Slingers. You don't really have any light cav units to really chase after them, except these two skink cohorts, and maybe. Your Stegadon, but in all honesty, you will suffer way too many losses with your Saurus Warriors against the Skaven Slingers just running and, th and peppering your enemy. Not to mention these Night Runners will cause a lot of damage too. Out of the battle, you will you're guaranteed a victory. However, you will suffer three losses. Occupy the the settlement, and you you should be good for now. Now, a word of warning when you continue pushing this campaign. Do not build up the Serpent Coast in the initial 10 turns, 10-15 turns. Because, essentially, we are going to be pushing our advantage into deep into Skaven territory to wipe out the enemy. The Beastmen up here, eventually, they're going to come down and attack the Serpent Coast. Financially, you're not strong enough to really support two armies to... One army to fight the Beastmen and one army to fight the Skaven. You need to focus one enemy at a time. But since you've taken the Serpent Coast, you can you can make an alliance and a trade agreement with Tlakla. I do apologize if I'm saying these names wrong. Make a non-aggression and a trade agreement with them and you can help them financially against their enemies. Eventually, what I've done a couple times is that... uh. This faction, this orange lizardman faction, will eventually make want to make a military alliance with you because you have common enemies. So there's good news in that. Once you make enough money, I would also suggest upgrading this to level two. But for now, just keep building up uh, the normal Saurus warriors. As for your leader, I would put one point into inspiring presence. 
you don't really need at the very beginning plus 10 percent movement range because you you'll be you'll be taking small steps to essentially just keep building up your forces so we'll move on to the next turn the skaven are in disarray for losing that one stack and right now you just have to press that advantage and not let them and not give them time to recover this is generally a strategy for all legendary campaigns in every Total War game. The more time you give the AI, the stronger they become. What should happen here is that the Skaven are going to reinforce the city to protect in the hopes that they might save it from being taken by your forces. Now, I must... Uh, the plan of attack here is to attack the biggest force outside. Don't attack the small army, do not attack the city directly. If you attack the city directly, there is a chance you can lose. However, if you attack the army from the outside, you will win. With your priest, go ahead and give him one point into harmonic convergence, and then attack. Attack the biggest army. If you want to play the battle, you might go ahead. But uh, personally, for this uh, starter guide, we'll go ahead and just use the autos. And these, this auto will guarantee victory. You will suffer a bit of attrition, a bit of losses, but you're always guaranteed a victory with this strategy. With the primary army, Skaven army destroyed, you could easily secure the city. The most important thing is not to lose these two units. The Saurus Warriors are all expendable, so not much of a problem in using losing them. Now when you secure this village, you have a chance to get a, uh, a military building. Sometimes you'll get one of these buildings, sometimes it won't be. Either way, if it's not here, if you do get the uh, spawn pools of lower casts, just keep building uh, skin cohorts. If you don't have the building, build the underground lagoon and just continue producing Saurus warriors. Invest in with your main leader. Invest in the points to make your Saurus warriors even more powerful. It'll give you a bigger edge in battle. Eventually what you're aiming for to build is the uh, the Saurus warriors with shields. That gives you a huge advantage against Skaven and it's generally something you want to go after as soon as possible. Eventually, once you get the Saurus Warriors of Shields, eventually you want to upgrade your like foot soldiers to Temple Guards so you don't have that Primal Instinct debuff. And eventually you also like start investing into like Light Cav units to give your army a bit of an edge. Because your weakness for the Lizardmen is that you don't have any good artillery. Your artillery is, in fact, very weak, and you have to rely on heavy beasts, heavily armored tanks or beasts to break through the enemy's lines. However, when, with, when it comes to, like, dragon units and stuff, like, throughout my campaign that I beat for Legendary, the hardest unit, the hardest battle was honestly fighting the, the Dark Elves in the finale battle. Because they brought in, like, Dark Dragons and... Like the war hydras, it's per for the uh, like having an, an all-out army of Saurus wars and shields. It's just it just isn't enough. Your your army will f hit, take casualties, and then once you that debuff kicks in, I mean, it's gonna be problems. The stegodon though, if if you're if you're lucky, you will get a blessed stegodon, but the stegodon in general is good to have because it has a ballista on its back. If you have like three or four of these stegodons for the, like these epic finale battles, those ballistas can do some damage. They might look small, but it's good to ca it's a good anti-large countering unit for range. 
As for your ace, eventually you're gonna go for the feral carnosaurs. And those will be very powerful. You get about maybe three of them, plus an agent or two on one. You have a very powerful anti large unit, but just keep in mind the biggest weakness of the Lizardmen is the fact that they don't have very powerful artillery, such as the Skaven or the High Elves and Dark Elves. So, now that we are we've captured this village, we'll go ahead and move on to the next turn. The Skaven are going to fall back to the Temple of Gold here, and they're going to try to regroup. Since you had to take one turn to build to build the uh, barracks, it's going to take a little bit of time here. You don't have to like move into position. You can attack straight from here and attack the their temple. So you can stay within the walls and not move your army out. These three units should be more than enough to secure this city. As for the campaign overall, I'll go ahead and give some more details. The reason we're doing this push so quickly, so early, is to destroy as many Skaven factions as possible, as quickly as possible. If you give the Skaven a lot of time to build, you're going to be going up against two, maybe three stacks at a time. And there's, a, there's three Skaven factions down here, so the more time you give them, the stronger they become. And eventually, they're going to get to their higher tier Skaven Corruption buildings. And their Skaven Corruption is actually going to spread through these mountains onto your cities. And you will suffer a public order penalty. Right now, it's not spreading. But give it give it like turn 50, 100, and the Corruption is going to start to kick in. And it's going to be difficult to deal with. Because you need public order buildings. You need financial buildings. And you need military buildings and it's and de and defensive buildings. That's generally a legendary strategy. Those are buildings you you require like they're necessary to stay alive. And it's not always like uh, easy just to go for an untainted temple to keep control of your empire. Go ahead and let those troops build up, and then eventually we will attack the temple of gold. An unaggr yeah. Another reason to not do a non-aggression pact with all of your surrounding neighbors is to get this mission quickly. And you also, by turn seven, you also get that mission to dis destroy Clan Mortgen. It's very, it it's perfect timing for you as well, because this this upcoming battle will literally destroy them. As for the the wood elves, At go ahead and make the an welcome you. Of course. I just gotta make a warning. If you when you create military allies with the other factions around here, the wood elves, the lizardmen, do not expect them to hold their ground against the other superpowers in the map. They will not help you against the vortex armies, and they sure as heck will not help you against the onslaught of the dark elves from up here. It seems extremely far to worry about Dark Elves, but don't you worry. The Cult of Pleasure will destroy the entire south here, and Malkith more than likely will win his war against the High Elves to the east. And eventually, it will come down to this continent here, and Malkith will keep pushing from the north, and the Cult of Pleasure will push in from the west. So it's going to be tough. This passage right here is more important than anything. And you know what, actually? Just to prove it to you guys, I'll show you a very quick clip of what could actually happen. Okay, <laughs> now that you guys understand what I mean, yeah, the situation could get pretty bad. 
It looks unwinnable, but that choke point is very powerful indeed. And you can win, without a doubt. Lightning strike, ambushes, and that perfect choke point will give you the advantage you need to win the upcoming battles. Now, with our main army, we will attack the Temple of Gold here. There should be a garrison, but it should be no problem for your army to do it. Now, there's probably some of you concerned of what we're actually doing here. Like, why would I expand so quickly when it's so difficult to maintain and control this whole area? Well, the thing is, I'm expecting to lose all three of these cities. That's not the problem. The goal was to expand, secure the Serpent Coast, and beat, defeat this Skaven clan as quickly as possible. We could take our army, build up more Skaven units, oh well, build up more Saurus units, and attack Clan Moldor right off the bat. Just go straight in at them. But to maintain control, we will have to pull our main army back. Force march them back and secure the Cursed Jungle so we can, in general, secure this province in general. Your two most safest cities and villages will be the capital, the Temple of Skulls, and the Cursed Jungle. These are good, two powerful, your two safest economic cities in this campaign. The Serpent Coast will be attacked quite often. Unless you can actually get an army to secure the Golden Tower. Because eventually Clan Morris over here is going to send an army to secure the ritual sites. It is, their, it is the AI's priority to go after these ritual sites, even out, if it's out of their way. They could be losing their entire empire and they will still send an army to secure the ritual sites. As for that, building up the Serpent Coast, it's about about now, well in a couple turns here, eventually the Beastmen will send their primary army to attack you, to attack these vulnerable cities, because the AI knows, and they will attack, and this is when you actually pull back your units. Invest one point to ten percent march, point to prime warrior, and with your priest, start investing to wind blast. You can also get yourself a little bit of money by doing the edict, and also get your barracks level too, since we obtained so much money through this small conquest. Clan Mulder will go to war with the Fortress of Dawn, and unfortunately, the High Elves will lose that war. I've had this event happen to me quite often in the early game, and in all honesty, get the hero as soon as possible. The more experience, if you incorporate him into your army, he will give the army experience, and honestly, leveling him up and to have him ride a Carnosaur is pretty powerful. Get some of your own feral carnosaurs, and you got like four. You got a basically an anti-large unit that will cause chaos on the battlefield. Very good to have. Be very careful on going for first march stance though around this area. Generally, the beastmen are somewhere around here. <laughs> But you do need to get back to your capital as soon as possible, because the rebellion's going about is going to happen very, very soon. I wouldn't. We're not upgrading the settlement because we're expecting to lose it. The uh, the beastmen could be very unpredictable. They they might know that you're around the area and they'll stay away, or they'll attack at different times. It's best not to invest into this region until it's actually secured. If these other factions are going to try to well, encourage a defensive alliance, military alliance, 
Sometimes the military alliance is worth it, but being forced into wars on legendary difficulty quite honestly isn't. I'm gonna go into normal stance because I do believe I'm suspecting I'm gonna get attacked by the beastmen, but honestly who knows? It's 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 a very difficult faction to predict. They're very they're a very unpredictable RNG faction. At about now is when it becomes a little bit unpredictable of what the AI will do for sure. But I do know that the Beastman will eventually attack this coastline because it knows that I've pulled my army back from the front lines. These territories will fall down to Skaven Rebellions and eventually Clive Mulder, Clive Mulder can actually push up. Or maybe Clive Moores will actually then secure these areas, but that's, that's not really that big of a problem. That's two Skaven factions versus there being three. Not to mention you got a good chunk of gold by attacking Clan Morkin so quickly and so early. Yeah, there we go. Ambusher discovered. Yeah, they're around the They'll be coming here very soon. You could invest into, like, if you were investing into building up the Serpent Coast, you could get maybe a tier 1 defense for that area. But in all honesty, to fight back an entire stack of beastmen, it's gonna... the chances of a victory are pretty low. You could play out, I mean, it's it's all up to you. Maybe on lower difficulties you can get away with a victory, but... on legendary... I don't think so. Another interesting fact is, like, to really secure your economics, you're gonna have to rely heavily on trade and that's that's a big thing about these medical plants down here if you really want to support like three well-equipped stacks against your enemies you could do a treasure hunt if you want to get that little side uh, quest out of the way but personally I generally prefer not wasting time and get everything up as soon as possible every turn is very Precious, and you have to like move very quickly. If we do this quickly enough, we can actually send back our army and deal with these rebellions. Looks like the beastmen are slightly delayed. Interesting. Actually, no, never mind. There they are. You must die. That's not the primary beastman army, by the way. That's just a secondary army. Their primary one is actually a full stack. Now, what are the Wood Elves doing on... This is actually new. I've done many, many campaigns, and this is actually new for the Wood Elves to actually... to approach on my land. Even if the Beastman army does come down and destroy these areas, you're gonna have to like definitely like garrison your troops so you can just replenish. 
Unfortunately, this village should fall and you more than likely will lose trade. With the priest, I'll just, I would just continue investing into Windblast. Or, if you want to, you can also invest into the Curse of Midnight. Both of these skills are very powerful to have. As for your attack, you will continue just improving your Saros units. Some people might find it strange that I didn't what I didn't destroy this building and get like like the skin cohorts, get some javelineers, but honestly, the Saros warriors with shields give you such a huge advantage in combat that it's almost silly. The auto balance is very heavily biased towards lizardmen, even if the enemy has a lot of uh, javelin units or close range units. It's quite fortunate for this campaign that I have the the Wood Elves actually helping me. But I would not rely on that at all. This is not a normal action. Generally about this time, you will be, have to be fighting a full stack of beastmen. Eventually they're going to attack. But in this campaign I just got very uh, lucky even though I didn't grant him military access. Azray, the woods of Athalorin welcome you. Do you, do you want your military message? access? I guess not. You just gonna cross into my borders and not even care. The medicinal plants would be very useful if I had a lot of trade, but in general, in the early game, this is not that powerful. Because I generally just don't have a lot of trade opportunities. Could I make trade with Tor Elasor though? I serve the king. If you st if you started turn one with a non-aggression pact, you could make an eventually get trade with them. But the thing is, eventually you want to attack those islands because you want to secure their powerful resources. I mean, we're talking forty thousand gold. That's better than any trade agreement I've ever done. And securing these uh, islands will also prove to be very beneficial with the ports that they provide. To get, a steady, get, to get steady a decent amount of steady of income, I would get the favelas right off the bat. Or if you really want to grow this area very quickly, you go for the growth. It, it's, it's either or. It depends on your playstyle completely. Personally, since our economy is very limited, I would go for the favelas so you can have a little bit more gold to work with here. It's about this stage where the campaign in general can be very unpredictable and different from the campaigns that you're playing. Normally, this army would be fighting the Beastman stack that comes down here at this stage. Now, what would be your goal from now on from here is to secure this territory in general. Once the rebellion is, is going to occur, you would destroy it with your main army and then secure this area even better. You can destroy the rebellion here and then move back to this territory down here. Luckily, you will not lose your gold building, but then again, your army will be basically split in two. You'll be securing the region to the north here, and then securing the region to the south. And basically stabilizing these regions through public order buildings and destroying a number of rebellions. And in all honesty, that destroying rebellions actually benefits you. It's not actually a con, but more of a pro. And a lot really depends on how you invest into your leader. Once your leader is experienced very well, you will be able to choose one of these blessings. If you're going to choose a blessing that will help you in your economics and not securing a lot of territories, go for this one. Huanchi. Income for post battle loot is plus 20%. That's huge. That's going to that that's going to secure you the money that you need to build units to build those expensive buildings and to stabilize and to have the money to really fight a number of different enemies. Yeah, 
if you don't want to go with Huan Chi, Class Kotal seems to be a pretty good one too. You get a plus 10% replenishment rate. The plus 5 local order is pretty useless and the untainted is useless, but that plus 10% replenishment rate is in general pretty good. But in overall, I would strongly suggest just getting that plus 20% post battle loot. And then just continue like upgrading your leader with uh, post battle loot and if you're going to do your tech, focus on technology, that will give you post battle loot as well. So, that will cover the early game for now. I want to show you guys the uh, late game of what happens and what you're generally going to be going after. But before that, I'll cover one more detail of what this strategy basically entails. You're going to be securing the coastline. And even if, once Clan Wars does eventually secure this ritual site, you'll be fighting quite often to gain control of it. Destroying the Golden Tower is probably the best strategy. You don't have to, like, completely raise it to the ground because Clan Wars will keep sending Skaven armies to resecure it. A good strategy would honestly be to just occupy it and then leave it. And then let the Skaven Rebellion take over the the area event until you can actually support two armies and with your primary army you're going to be pushing down this coast and securing all these territories if Tor Elasaur starts securing some areas down here then your plans need to change a little bit because if you can't secure an entire province and issue an edict to like improve the public order growth you're, it's just not worth taking a city because you can't secure the province so eventually, you will be using your main army to attack and raid Tor Elasaur's ports. You can occupy them and then leave them. And eventually a rebellion is going to start, and, but that rebellion will not belong to Tor Elasaur. It's going to be a high elf rebellion, but they're going to be independent and they're not going to attack or do anything. That's a different story to the Fortress of Dawn, though. If you try to attack them and then just leave and let the rebellion grow it's going to be a fortress of dawn army and basically the faction will come back from the dead but with tor elasaur take occupy the well sack them then occupy them and then just move on to the next city and just island hop them and you should secure a good amount of gold that's if they start like taking cities from the skaven down here because that's only delaying you, and you really do need the money to really fund a proper army. If the Skaven are pushing very hard, and your army is located somewhere down here, and they're pushing and like destroying like some of your economic cities down over here, continue to push and destroy the Skaven from this land. Once they're gone, you can just bring your army back and just deal with all the, the attrition losses, and then just... And then you basically just guarantee yourself that this whole region is Skaven free. Now, I'll bring you guys to the late game and show you what happens and the strategies that I use to actually beat this campaign. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck is happening? Why is the Cult of Pleasure already down here? That's what happens when the Dark Elves are left unchecked. The Cult of Pleasure has essentially conquered... Lord Mazdamundi, without any resistance, they've been conquering the coastlines, attacking, raiding, and eventually pushing all the way down towards me. They have a beachhead on the Fortress of Dawn, and, are, and will continue to send troops attacking this coastline. As for Malekith, Malekith has been victorious against this war against the High Elves, and after conquering Lothurn, he's going to be pushing south into the deserts, and is essentially conquering everything in this area, pushing all the way towards me. The only reason he's attacking the Golden Tower is because it's a ritual site. And he will keep continue to send armies at me at a continuous pace, really. I mean, it, it, the um, Dark the Malachis armies essentially never end. And in the meantime, I'm fighting Vortex armies at the same time. When you, when you have the Golden Tower, this is essentially what you need. You need tier 3 defenses for walls and building the golden tower which gives you two temple guards 
This is a decent stack. Plus, the armies that you'll be utilizing, that's how you hold down this choke point. The reasoning I didn't fight the Dark, the, uh, the Cult of Pleasure pushing on this coastline is because I brought all my armies back to protect a ritual site against a massive vortex army that spawned in the shifting sands up here. We're talking, yeah, like 10 stacks, 10. That's, I'm adding also the Dark Elves attacking nonstop, so it's about 10 stacks that was attacking this area. One of my ar one of my armies suffered some pretty heavy casualties. This one, but my other two did pretty well. As for my finale battle, this was the army that I utilized to win that battle. Also against, it's not the this is not the army I used against the Dark Elves because, in all honesty, that battle was close. And the biggest mistake was having, uh, what, Saurus warriors with shields. That Primal Instinct debuff is just brutal. It almost costed me the game. I have my leader, the priest, the veteran, and about five temple guards. This is just a frontline unit, just to hold off the enemy. Strong unit, though. I have four heavy cav units to basically, like, flank, hit the enemy from behind. These feral carnosaurs, plus my scar veteran, that's about four carnosaurs. They're my heavy anti-large units, pretty good at destroying lines. And these three plus stegodons are what I use to basically like take down like heavy like what, large units from range, from dragons to war hydras to eagles to anything. As for these two blessed pterodon riders, these uh they have they have much of like I would say a multi-purpose, like. You can attack the enemies from behind, you can attack them using these bo their bombs, and they're a very good multi-purpose unit, which honestly is pretty good for the Lizardmen, and I like them a lot. They don't do a ton of damage, but you can improvise pretty well with them and do some serious damage to the enemy. And that's essentially my army in a nutshell. There are, there are like, other, like, specialized units you can build, like the Agent Stegadon, or the Re the crystal. In all honesty, I am the blessed stegodons are more than enough. Not to mention they give you they have the bonus stats versus normal stegodons, so in general this army is more than enough to beat anything. You could beat multiple armies of the Vortex with this unit by itself. As for this army, this army was just built in a last minute attempt to like fight in like dealing with the Vortex army. It's just building a bunch of Heavy units and feral stegodons, very powerful force. You just have to rely on a very, like, brute force, aggressive type of playstyle, and not not even bother with ranged units. Just go f quickly for the melee, and destroy the army as quickly as possible before it can regroup. As for my temple, I'll show you what my I have my in my main province. With my main province, I focused on getting the Untainted as quickly as possible because the uh, Clan Wars was actually doing some serious damage with their high-level corruption building that was spreading across these mountains. So I need to build this temple to like, just counter it. All my ritual sites had level 5 walls, but even that's not really enough. I mean, when you're considering how many stacks are attacking. The reason the Serpent Coast hasn't been upgraded is maybe it actually fell. I mean, sometimes like it's it's just not possible to hold every every city every front. If ten stacks rush a city very quickly, it could, it could fall. As for like these, this for a geomatic spire, that's the advantage of the lizardman. But in all honesty, it's just not really that useful. It's not that it gives it gives the buildings in the region a small public bonus of income. But really, what really keeps your like this faction alive? Is trade like I'm getting I used to get I used to get a lot more money when I was when I had a trade agreement with this dwarf faction up here but ever since uh ever since Malk has been securing all of his ports I lost that trade deal and that trade deal by itself was like 2,000 gold Zlatlan I want to say this this lizardman is completely useless uh, he hasn't won a victory ag against the dark house at ever and he has never helped at all so in general a very useless ally but 
me. I'll take as gold. The pirates of Sartosa will eventually be your friends, which is actually kind of funny. And, um, I mean, hey, gold's gold, right? But uh, be very careful in creating any, like, distrust or breaking trade agreements or non-aggression packs. Because the last thing you want to deal with is other factions hating, other factions in the world hating you. Eventually, everyone's going to hate the Dark Elves, and eventually you can utilize that to your advantage. But... You want to beat the campaign as soon as possible because as time progresses, the Dark Elves only get stronger and stronger and stronger. If I went to like turn 300, more than likely, the Cult of Pleasure would control all everything here and Malekith would finish his conquest over here without any problems. So, that concludes my legendary starter guide for The Last Defenders. I do realize that this, uh, I'm changing up the format a little bit, seeing if you guys like it or not. And if you have any questions in regards to your legendary campaigns, or, or any other campaigns in general, feel free to comment in the comment section below, and I'll answer you guys as soon as possible. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.